Are you happy? When somebody asks you. And you are happy. But it's really sincerely from bottom of your heart can be decide and say, yes, I'm really happy today. That not many times happens. No. Yes, I'm happy, but yeah, I'm happy, but then they have other things lined up. Why? That is the question. Because you do not have decisiveness. That means you don't have no dignity yet. Hi, friends. Welcome back to another season of the Showing Up podcast. I'm so excited to have you back, and I can't wait to share the newest guests for this season. I'm professional athlete and artist, Lindsay Dyer, and this is Showing Up, a podcast I created to encourage you to embrace your weird, to do the thing even if you suck at it, and to fully show up for this one wild and precious life. That was one of the holiest, most spiritual beings and Buddhist teachers on the planet today. Ordained by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, from a very young age, Pachak Rinpoche is said to have been the reincarnation of many high spiritual beings that have reached high spiritual accomplishments through his seven incarnations on the planet. We recorded this interview during his visit to Jackson, hosted by my dear friend and high alpine doctor, Dr. Schlim. <laughs> Dr. Schlim has brought me back from the dead many times in foreign countries volunteering and in the high alpine. I owe so much to him as well as bringing this very special man to our town. Over four days that he shared his teachings, we learned about so many of the Buddhist principles, as well as his new book, Radically Happy, A User's Guide to the Mind, which he co-wrote with former Silicon Valley entrepreneur and meditation teacher, Dr. Solomon. You'll also hear his voice in this interview. Rinpoche and I talked about the new book and what it means to be radically happy, how we can find contentment in the present moment, why we should be lions instead of dogs, and how to avoid comparing ourselves. I spent four days sitting in a very cold cabin listening to the Rinpoche and his teachings, but my favorite part was the fact that he was so human and so relatable, even coming from a different country at just 38 years of age. This is a really inspiring conversation. And just before we hit record, we watched a mother and three grizzly bears pass just in front of us. <laughs> I hope you can take some of that magic and enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Let's just start by, by describing where we are. It's been a beautiful few days here in the backcountry of the Wyoming backcountry. How are you guys liking it? Wow, it's beautiful. I've never been here before. It's uh... The space, the sense of space is really inspiring. You've never been? No, I, think I love Jackson Hall because uh, the, um, uh, the environment and the building is very controlled and the animals is quite free to uh, go out and I saw before bison and uh, very natural and I like the part of the real natural. Mm. You know, mm. This is what I like. How does it compare to where you guys grew up? Well, I grew up in Boston, and uh, I spent a lot of time by the sea, so it's completely different. <laughs> yeah. It couldn't be more different, really. Yeah, so I know that you you kind of came up, and what's so interesting about the, bo the both of you is that you're so different, mm -hmm. but you also have so much in common, mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear the story of how you came together, and also, but maybe start with... Your background. I know mm. you came up in the AI world, <laughs> uh, and and you came up in this spirituality world. Um, so, do you want to start with? Okay. And then how you came together? Yeah, I mean, you say I came up in the AI world, and it was really almost literally being born into it. My aunt uh, Cynthia Solomon was doing research with computers and kids in the '60s and '70s with two brilliant scientists, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, who were creating uh, theories about what the mind is, what consciousness is, how you could recreate that in a machine, how children learn. And um, 
Rinpoche is just shaking his head. Yeah, I'm saying, wow, it's amazing, right? Yeah, oh. it was amazing. And and as a little kid, um, because what, one thing that was remarkable about all three of them is they didn't talk to children condescendingly. They talked to children with genuine curiosity and, and sharing as much as, as was possible with my young mind. And so I, I, um, I got very curious about what mind is. And it uh, eventually led me to um, studying Buddhism, which I think has a very profound um, exploration of what mind is. And then I met uh, Rinpoche's grandfather as a result of that, and, and then later met Rinpoche when he was still quite young. I've been noticing over this past few days, there's such a, a sense of, I don't have a word for it, um, magic <laughs> in Rinpoche's presence. And I've heard about it with your grandfather. Uh, can you explain that at all? <laughs> I think, mm, um, I think, I think this kind of uh, feeling uh, is the comes, uh, I think, when we connected ourselves, being very um, sincere and nothing there to be hiding, nothing there to be managed, it just being a free flow, uh, what comes from the heart and a deep in from the nature from the heart. And I think that the sincereness, I think, is what really we uh, feel. I think this is, I think it's what I think that I can, I felt from my grandfather, who is, can be very humble, the most humble spiritual teacher that I have ever met. Absolutely. And, and he is actually the teacher of the really great high, um, you know, ranking, you know, uh, spiritual leaders nowadays. And he always being humble and dressed very humble and I'm not acting humble. He is very humble. Mm -hmm. And he, his disciples stay higher than him when he gives teachings. And that is in, insane in our meditation traditions. That it doesn't work like that. Always teacher is higher than his disciples. But in him case, it's completely opposite about that. That's a pretty crazy act to have to follow, right? I know you were chosen at the age of one year mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. And I know you, uh, in the book, you said that you struggled with, with anger oh, yes. as a teenager. Yeah. I think a lot of men can relate. Can mm -hmm. you speak to that? Yeah, I think it, for me is uh, because of, uh, of course I born into very old tradition of meditation for 800 years, following meditators, my father's forefathers and forefathers. You know, all that is really great. I have no problem with my parents' food. I have excellent parents. They only came from in from my side because when I went to college, monks' college to studies, there's so much need to study and so much you know, tensions that I have uh, in in studies, and it's never enough. It's never enough and never good enough for myself. And um, then my teachers and everybody, you know, uh, sort of um, saying that you need to do better than this or something like that. Then I be become very frustrated, and the frustration slowly grow up and becomes a uh, anger mm -hmm. then uh, but I don't beat people I don't punch people or things like that because I'm a principal Buddhist um, you know so I punch a wall but not many <laughs> because it's going to injure your hand I just punch once <laughs> and I'm quite a manageable anger a smart angry person but really angry that's why I punch but I'm not going to punch too much yeah it doesn't work, anything, whatever you do, it doesn't work. So that is the reason behind that I met uh, my meditation teacher who actually um, asked me to think and tell me that you should not be like a dog and you should be like a lion. Be like a lion. And that is the thing. This is such a beautiful story in the book. Mm. Uh, yeah, what does it mean to be, to be like a lion instead of a dog? Basically, I follow, I chase, uh, I listen and I look and I chase after my anger, anger thoughts and anger feelings and anger itself and I become more angry. And when I look at who, who is the anger, where is anger arising from, who is actually becoming angry, when I look in to, towards the person, I don't see the anger. So you're saying at first you assume it's outside of you. It's the people that are making you angry. It's, it's the situation. People, it's, it's people, situation. I hate myself. I hate everybody. I hate religion. I hate Buddha. I hate hell. 
I hate basically everything. So you're really suffering at this point. I don't want to say I'm suffering. I'm really angry. <laughs> I don't like to call suffering because I'm not inward suffering, but my anger was outward. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I agree with you. It's suffering, but I don't like to say suffering because it's, I don't keep it in. I sort of express it out. But I think a lot of men, especially, can relate. Yes, hundred percent. I think is sure. people have that situations. Yeah. The the point of the lion and the dog metaphor, because this was an ancient example, which Rinpoche's teacher actually is very well known for. Anybody who who studied with him got some version of don't be like a dog, be like a lion. And the thing is that we're always chasing thoughts, right? We have a sense impression. We start, I like that, and then we think about it, or I don't like that, and we think about it, and we think about the next thought and the next thought, and pulls us farther and farther away from simply just being present in the face of whatever thought, emotion, situation is arising. So when you throw a stone at a dog, a dog chases the stone. You throw a stone at a lion, the lion turns to look and see who's throwing the stone. At that moment, if you're the stone thrower, you're either going to run away or the lion's going to eat you. Either way, there are no more stones. So this is actually a very, very beautiful metaphor for an internal process that we can choose. Either we can be like a dog with our thoughts, always chasing every thought habitually, or we can be a lion and gradually learn to place our attention in the direction of where the thoughts come from. And then what's really interesting when we do that is thoughts and emotions still can come, but they no longer own us. Mm-hmm. We own them. So how did you learn this as a tech entrepreneur in the Bay Area? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I was in the Bay Area for a long time. Well, as I said, um, my interest in in what is mind led me to study Buddhism. uh, First, just as an intellectual exercise. And then um, as a student, I I met... uh, some Tibetan teachers and what they said intrigued me and then I wanted to meet a real you know authentic uh, great master who had come to spiritual maturity uh, in Tibet before the Cultural Revolution so really untouched by modernity you know fully and that led me to Rinpoche's grandfather who was I think one probably the most amazing person I ever met in my life and just Entering the room with him, your mind changed. The quality of your mind changed. I mean, and then, of course, when he began to teach, it, it, it was just something totally extraordinary. So, um, so I was, yeah, working as a, uh, first as a programmer and later did some entrepreneurial things and tried a few different companies, all the normal stuff you do in Silicon Valley. But I was taking time every year to go to Nepal and study. And also, the uh, nice thing about the Bay Area is lots of great Tibetan teachers come. And I was also taking advantage of the fact that I lived in a place where, where they would come and I would study uh, with them as well. So that's kind of... I guess um, all these two things are going on at the same time in my life. So how did you two come to connect and decide that <laughs> why this book, why now? Because I start um, traveling to give uh, t- teachings and talks at uh, age of 22 wow. to uh, start traveling. And uh, I actually... Um, uh, my, try to do the best I can and I saw the the people's uh, actually um, the, the the system uh, the whole goal of the world is actually changing so fast and what I try to explain is they actually don't cannot digest at all or cannot not actually um, sort of I'm not able to talk to them I cannot uh, I cannot explain they're able to understand so that had to be frustrating mm, Mm, but um, I don't feel the frustration, but I feel like I need to find a way to teach. And I, I, this is who I am because I do, for me, the teaching is, is not about me, actually. It's about them. You want them to receive it. And this is the whole, my whole purpose yeah. of uh, teaching. And uh, so I really don't care my character or way of my teaching or my talks. And the most is how to deliver it correctly for the people. 
so I did a few things, you know, I created a few things, small things, you know, I wrote a small booklets, you know, uh, but it doesn't work. And then I have some ideas. Then we met time, then he's already uh, uh, done meditations and doing the teachings at other very big organizations and the many old things like that. Then I say, okay, we should do something together. Then he said, okay, we do it together. It's a very good idea. Then when, we just wrote. When was that? Oh, four about, about four years ago. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, that is actually uh, uh, pretty accurate. But the, it really starts with a friendship. And the fact that Rinpoche and I, uh, because we were both first in the same uh, monastery going, you know, and, I mean, he lived there and I would go visit in Nepal. And then later his uncle uh, would take him to America and and they came and stayed with mm -hmm. me and we really really hit it off and um, his uncle actually said to me that I should uh, do a long retreat which I did and then I came out and the monastery I'd been at asked me if I would um, create a meditation program and I thought I really have no idea what's going on in the world anymore. I've been four years sort of living on a mountain in France. Is this, this pre-bubble, pre-tech? No, no, no. The, I, the tech bubble, the first one had come and gone. Which it's the second one had come and gone. <laughs> so this is like 2010, 11, something like that. And um, so I, I went to New York where I could take... Uh, Buddhist meditation classes, Hindu uh, kind of secular classes, also seeing what, who, who, seeing different teachers, how they taught. As kind of, because I'm a Silicon Valley guy, I want to do market research. And then, uh, then we developed this cl uh, class, I led the effort, and, um, and this is kind of my last big entrepreneurial act was creating this, you know, it was a website and, a, and, a, and an online and offline program. But what, so I beta tested and I went and I gave classes. And what I saw was such a hunger, especially amongst people who are younger. They wanted to have, you know, there's still a lot of frustration about what had happened in the global financial crisis. So a lot of cynicism about old school hierarchies like religious, government, business, you name it. People were looking for another narrative for their life, other than greed, aggression. They th didn't feel like that had worked out so well for the world. But at the same time, wanting the same thing everybody wants, a nice life with an interesting career or a fulfilling career, we should say. And, you know, and, and meeting maybe a nice life partner and, 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 and having a family or, or these sorts of things. So I, I, but they weren't that interested in becoming Buddhist. They were interested more in just taking something that fit into their lives. And I could even see how traditional Buddhist presentation didn't always fit into the lives that people had today. So then Rinpoche and I just by chance happened to be in Kathmandu uh, for different reasons. And we had a, a dinner one night and we started talking and I thought, because he's a young and very dynamic and, and fabulous teacher, he'd be interested in what I'd learned, but it was almost like we were finishing each other's sentences that you night. You still do that now. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's like he's your translator. Yeah, well, we've, so we've, we've talked about this now for five years. Four years ago, we started the idea of the book. And so what, what was really interesting is even though he, we were coming from di very different angles on it, I was thinking more like a Silicon Valley product developer would think of it, and he was thinking of it naturally more like a Tibetan Buddhist teacher would think of it. Um, we still had this same observation. What, can we, what could we give people that fits into the lives they already have that would be highly leveraged enough that could make a profound difference in people's lives. And this conversation happened over the course of quite some time. And then about four years ago, we decided, actually, we started with the idea we'd make a program mm -hmm. and then thought, oh, but maybe no one will listen to us. We better write a book first. With lots of colors. <laughs> yeah, the that, colors was, that really was actually in the original <laughs> idea that we would make, that would be, we don't want Beautiful to make heavy. Yeah, 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 you can tell. But it's very representative of who you both are, too. Mm -hmm. You're light, you're, you're jovial, and it really comes across, which is mm -hmm. very different than what we're used to seeing in the mm -hmm. teachings. Mm -hmm. And forgive me, but it also gives me 
uh, a little bit more courage to ask like some the harder questions. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I've always wanted, I mean, you came over at 22. Mm-hmm. None of us know what we're doing at 22. <laughs> and then you came to a foreign country. It, uh, you gave an example this week of seeing uh, uh, Porsche Cayennes and seeing people with so much. And it, uh, it must have, has it ever been hard knowing uh, that your people or other people come from such a different life and yet you're supposed to want the same thing for all people, even the people that, that have so much like in this country. Mm. I think it's a very interesting. Of course, the first I want to say that when I see nice cars and all these things, of course, it, you know, temptation. temptation is there, of course. I think we all have that. You know? And mm. I realized that actually in America that uh, the, the way of advertisement is a, such a nice and such a sneaky and they just go in the, in the back of your mind that you don't realize that actually mm. you, you actually brainwash it automatically to buy that products um. so i realized this really then one of my friends says oh you know you know you know that Rinpoche in the university they actually study human mind and what kind of color what kind of phone or letter how high how low what sound what color should you use for the people actually able to buy the products i, I said what did they do study like that so then means we have really become very vulnerable Actually, and that is one thing I want to share first. Um, yes, definitely. I thought in America, people' life is very happy, but then I keep meeting more and more and more. Then I realize that we all kind of same. And I have one friend that he has a really expensive bed, and I sleep in his bed. He's really nice, and, <laughs> and he says, "But you, how, how is your sleeping? It's so good, you know. The bed is so nice." And I said, "How is you sleeping normal? It's really not good." I said, "What?" I said, Rinpoche, this, the bed is $10,000. I said, you're paying $10,000 bed, but you can't sleep well. That is really worth nothing, you know. And I realized that actually a lot of people have so much, but at the same time, they don't have the much that what I value. Okay. So then that, that is the thing that I see. It's very really beautiful. Yeah. Well, so what do you value? I think what I value is the anything a little bit more comfortable in life. And openness, the carefree, carefree ease is what I really look for in life. And of course, comfortable uh, place and eat good food and have a nice uh, water or like this kind of things. Of course, you know, it's nothing. But the more main important for me is really carefree ease. Is I is my fundamental reminding of my life in that yeah. place. Mm-hmm. I think I think what Rinpoche is saying is. Um, it's not a problem to be comfortable, but this carefree ease makes it so that if we have comfortable circumstances, mm-hmm. we can really enjoy, enjoy it. it yes. And if it doesn't come, we also have it's carefree, carefree ease. ease yes. that, this is, that's the point. This is the point. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Uh-huh. So at a time like this, uh, for a book called Radical Happiness, uh-huh. why do we need it? And where... <laughs> You know, uh, one of the phrases in the book says, happiness comes from unhappiness. Can you explain that? Be- well, I think a lot of people come to find yeah, that's these right. types of teaching because they're suffering. I, I, think, I think in order to understand what happiness really could be, you have to look first at what is frustrating or what's dissatisfying about the way we're currently trying to be happy. I mean, everybody knows, I'm going to sound like a Hallmark greeting card, right? Oh, you don't find happiness in situations and things. You find happiness within. So we all kind of know this, but let's take an honest look of how we behave. And we are constantly, most of our time is preoccupied with creating circumstances or avoiding circumstances. Maybe even more it's about avoiding stuff or getting the right things or keeping the right things that we already have, jealously guarding them. And and, and again, that's not in and of itself either good or bad. In fact, it's understandable. You want a safe, comfortable place to live. Everybody wants that. That's perfectly fine. The, The problem is, is how much we invest in the success of that endeavor. 
So there's three main problems we have when we look for, for happiness in circumstances. The first one is we're just really, really bad at predicting what's going to make us happy. And in the book, there's this great example of looking at the happiness of paraplegics, people who recently found out they were going to be condemned to a life in a wheelchair, versus people who won huge amounts of money, like $150 million lottery winners. And what's interesting is initially, of course, there's a big difference between these two groups. The lottery winners are super happy, and understandably, the, the, new, the people who just lost their legs are unhappy. But what's, and when you think about it, you think, given that choice, oh, definitely, I want the money. But the reality is that after a year, there's absolutely no difference between these two groups of people. And if we, we, when we do the thought experiment, you really can't believe it. Emotionally, you can't believe it. But there's the data. Then the next problem is that we um, are, are already, when we've found a comfortable position, we've created the circumstances for future dissatisfaction. And you see that in just as you're listening to this podcast, you're going to sit in a certain position, you're probably quite comfortable, and after a few moments, you're going to shift. That position in your chair or your bed or wherever you're sitting when you're listening to this, that initially was comfortable, actually is already, you've set in motion the dissat future dissatisfaction, you'll need to shift. And just, I'll say to everybody listening, watch your life, see it. It's a pattern again and again and again it happens. And then the final thing is we don't even know how to enjoy ourselves when things are going really well. And everybody has had the experience on a great day of leaning back and with a sigh going, oh, too bad every day can't be like this. Underneath our experience, we always are dissatisfied even when it's going well. The too bad it can't be. Instead of just... It is, and being with it as it is. So that's, that, that's, the, that's where we say when you start with unhappiness, is really taking a look at our sort of happiness generation strategies and can they possibly work. Mm -hmm. So what would be the first step towards changing this? Because you're, you're absolutely right. That mm -hmm. becomes habitual thinking mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> and we're stuck. Yeah. I think... Mm, they have uh, so much to say and they have uh, so little to time and uh, that the whole reason because of that to bring up the book and to make sure <coughs> that our message can be actually go to people and have a very light so the idea was is that we created a steps that people to understand so the basic happiness is something that we need to be uh, create our own base home safety home or some base on yourself then from there we have three um, steps of basic happiness exercise and you know things to do then you slowly build up interconnected happiness to feel the connection to the world or the people or the environments or whatever which is the second chapter and second the yeah mm -hmm. second section second section yeah. and they have three steps there then there's, there's two two practices then it comes back the radical happiness uh, that we discuss and that is the third uh, chapter or the third section the last section is of the book so this is the idea that we created why radical you know you, you ask the question i think that the first i want to say you know radical because you know, life is now really becoming dynamic and very much radical means they have a method they can to apply to have you know radically you know swiftly in you know, a little bit way and you can actually see the happiness very fast. This is one way I want to say. The, the, another way is... Well, radical in Latin means root. And haven't we lost the root of happiness? We're so busy chasing thoughts and emotions like a dog that we never turn to look in the direction of where those thoughts and emotions come from <laughs> and interrupt this habit uh, that brings us further and further away from who we really are. And so to answer, to go back to answering your question, the first step then is to just get used to being able to place our attention in the present moment. Just being able to, in the face of whatever comes to our mind, whatever thoughts, sensations, emotions, whatever comes, that we can just be fully and completely present. And there's a lot of good science about this. It shows when we're present moment focused, we're more likely to be well within ourselves, even in something that's unpleasant. 
than as opposed to, this is really shocking, like being stuck in rush hour traffic. You're more likely to be happy or well in yourself, maybe happy is too strong, if you're present moment focused than even if you're having a pleasant daydream. Okay, so I, I remember that and that right. was in, okay. mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, and so, but to get there, are you suggesting to get to that present moment, mm. start a practice of well, okay. The practice. I mean, the, we, we have a, a, a whole bunch of steps, but the first thing, and it's actually the, the sort of basic exercise for the whole book is something so we call... So maybe you're listening to this in traffic right now. Yeah. <laughs> what could you be doing? Well, in traffic, just notice your breathing. Just notice your breath. This isn't the first thing, but the first thing in the book you don't want to do in traffic because you need to watch the road. But just by noticing, feeling your breath, in your body, it brings you into the present moment. Or another thing you can do, you have your hands on the steering wheel. Just notice the feeling <clears throat> of the steering wheel in your hands. That brings you into the present moment. And that's a better state than daydreaming while sitting in traffic. Mm -hmm. it, well, it depends. The, the, daydreaming is great for creativity. Like my wife's an artist, and she, but she chooses to daydream. Consciously. That's right. The problem is when we just let it flow habitually, it, always, it often ends up in something that takes us so far from the present moment and it has a side effect that we're less well within ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think you really nail it with this statement. Um, the basis of our discontent is our ongoing, never-ending evaluation of the quality of our experience, relaxing the comparing. I think in this day and age, one of our greatest sources of suffering mm -hmm. is constantly comparing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you help us with an <clears throat> antidote to that? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should say something about comparison and then I'll... Have you ever dealt with that? I mean, we, we, we see you in these robes and we make assumptions that you have reached a place that, that far beyond what we ever feel. Have you, no, have you dealt? No. Of course you've dealt with these things. Yeah, I, I don't, and I, I, I don't, I, I don't think that uh, I reached somewhere that no, no one, I think it's anyone can reach it. It's a, it's a very simple thing. So I think the most important healthy part is for me, the best way to actually you need to notice that how much comparison is you going on. For me is to see it is first. It's very important. Now I do comparisons before. No now. What what is comparison? Comparison means you and others. You know, that, that person's much happier than me. You know. But it could also be all oh, this work what I'm doing. It's just not good enough. Not good yeah, enough. It can be to an idealized version an idealized of your life. Version, feelings, work, anything we, right. we do compare. Right. So who is the really being unhappy after that when you do the comparison? Is you? Yeah. So most of the time the comparison, we don't have no satisfaction. Of course, Sultan it has, or I compare, I'm very happy today. I, I did a great job. <laughs> but that is <laughs> quite not many sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit more opposite way. So that's what comparison is not good enough. So it's what you're Thanks. saying. What I hear you saying is it's when it... it it becomes habitual and you're not even conscious mm -hmm. that you're always comparing. Comparing, yeah. uh, And so, so how... So, I mean, it's really, really simple. Just find something to have gratitude for or appreciate. And uh, it can be something basic, like, I like my hoodie. I, I like my hoodie. I like how it looks on me. Or I, I enjoy how it feels. Or, you know, um, um, it just any thing that's simple in our lives we can begin with and to create as soon as you get into this moment of appreciation the comparison dissolves it doesn't have the same strength so by constantly reminding and bringing to mind what it is about your life that you like then you break the strength of the comparison now it's not that all even negative comparison is bad because obviously sometimes you need to reflect on your life and think, you know, am I in the right job, mm -hmm. right? But the problem is we loop. 
we just go on and on and on. Oh, it's the wrong job. Oh, because maybe there's nothing right now we can do about it. Maybe today I see I'm in the wrong job, but there's no, there's, there's no, maybe where I live, there's not other options right now. So then there's no point in going on. We can, but we can think what's a small step I can take to begin to change it. Maybe it's going to take a, a couple years to get to a different place in my life. But there's just, so that, then that's a healthy kind of comparison. But that isn't what we usually do. It's usually just profoundly self-denigrating, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can definitely relate. So would you suggest any, so first is noticing, yeah. because mostly we're not even noticing. <clears throat> that's right. That we're putting down any experience before we could even get joy from it. That's right. Would you suggest that anytime you do notice, is that when you say, okay, I just, I, I had one of those experiences, I'm going to replace it with something I appreciate? Mm -hmm. Or would you suggest that just make it a daily practice? Well, of course you should. You want to create a habit, right? So that even just comes spontaneously. So you start appreciating without thinking I'm going to appreciate. I think that is the, the biggest important uh, goal is to have habit. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have a very healthy comparison, but it doesn't produce that kind of uh, unhappiness. You have it's gentle noticing that you what need to be improved and you just being happy what you have or something to be appreciate. Sure is easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> Actually it's quite easy when you do a few times more. Yeah? Yes. How long do you, would you say if you started these practices, uh, you know, noticing bringing yourself back to the present moment? Two minutes. Two minutes. One minute, minute you... two minutes, three minutes. But how long before this habitual thinking would you start, maybe start noticing shifts? Moment you actually uh, noticing, actually it begins to shifting. <laughs> it's that powerful. Awesome. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, let's also, because people are going to, there's a potential trap here, which is the very basis, the quote you said earlier from, um, actually it's from Rinpoche's grandfather. And when he, I heard him say this about uh, the basis of our discontentment is the constant evaluation, the quality of our experience. It was like that statement alone changed my life. Yeah, it, it really stuck out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's yeah, yeah, it. that's it. That's it. Right. Exactly. And, and because we're always, it's like the CNN ticker at the bottom of our screen, always telling us how we're doing. <laughs> yeah. And then it becomes these great big comparisons. But the, the thing that we don't want to do is like constantly check has it changed? I did the exercise, has it changed? Because then we're back in this trap of evaluating. So it's just a simple, gentle appreciation that we build in our life. A gentle, simple noticing our breath and bringing ourselves into the present moment without constantly checking, am I doing it right? You know how you're doing it right? It's a binary. You're doing it or you're not doing it. So if you have that moment of appreciation, you're doing it right. You don't need to measure it. If you notice your breath, you're doing it right. You don't need to check. You don't need to, you know, monitor, am this the present moment or am I, you know. And that like he was of. saying, you have that sense of relief almost immediately mm -hmm. and therefore you know. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned it earlier, but I had written down, do we really know what will make us happy? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, the science says that we're really, really bad at predicting. Right. And um, so uh, I gave this one example, and I think if you think about it, the, you know, you, you, the science is clear. There's no difference between the paraplegics and the right. uh, lottery winners. But emotionally, look, even me, I've said, talked about this hundreds of times. Emotionally, I still go, it's the money. That's, that's how we're wired. And... Um, there are probably some good evolutionary reasons why, but it doesn't work for predicting happiness. It just doesn't work. Has there ever been a time when you really needed these teachings, like that you were at a low point in your life and, and you saw that it, it made all the difference? Yeah, many times. I mean, there were business setbacks. I talk about one in the book. It's actually, I, um, the, the story in the book, I... I I mean, this, let me just say, this is not so you feel sorry for the affluent guy standing in his uh, swimming pool who, who <laughs> you know, lost a lot of money. But 
But this is funny about how our mind works. I, I suffered an enormous loss, a business uh, decision that went really bad. And uh, I, I mean, I had still, on, on, you know, by anybody's normal standard, it's a great life, but I couldn't see it. You and couldn't then even feel it. I couldn't said. even feel it. That's right. And I got this crazy call from an old teacher of mine, and, and he just said something very simple, like, right now everything's okay. Don't think about yourself too much. And I started to reflect, and I noticed, because I was meditating, when I brought myself into the present moment, it's true. I was okay. When I was at the office and there were a number of people who were devastated by this, this problem, I would just naturally, it was my responsibility as an executive to be there for them. And, and so I did it without thinking. And during those moments, I wasn't thinking about myself and my own problems. I was thinking about the, this one guy had, had been planning on, on using this some money for, for his kid's education and now he was really, uh, you know, in a panic because he didn't know how he's going to, he's going to make ends meet. And so, you know, uh, you know, it's just really simple sometimes. Just come into the present moment and don't think about yourself too much. I love it. That's the biggest takeaway that I've been, I'll take away from this week mm -hmm. with you all is, uh, as we come in maybe with all of these personal struggles and, and suffering mm. and the antidote seems to be the these beautiful meditations for the well-being of everyone else and even just the 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 act of of doing these meditations it fulfills you yes and uh, I've been sleeping better <laughs> uh, I've been feeling more full and it's it's so incredible how uh, to have that genuine wish for others somehow brings yourself all of the same gifts. But it doesn't work, like Rinpoche was saying, if you're uh, tackling or, or doing any of these meditations only for yourself, it's, it's like it doesn't, it, you don't get the same benefits. I think in the beginning, it's okay to do it a little bit for yourself. And then, but then, uh, over time, we can, we can, so in the beginning, basic happiness is focused on me. Because without a healthy sense of self, it's very difficult to start talking about caring for others. Yeah, I think, uh, I think first need to create base. And then you get to interconnect. Then interconnected. So tell us what interconnected happiness means. The first thing I want to say that interconnected meaning that whatever you achieve or whatever you, wherever you are, is not just by yourself. There are so many different peoples, different circumstances, different things that actually um, uh, come together, and few percentage of yourself, uh, effort and your and talent and your knowledge and your experience, with the, all the different peoples and circumstances, and you reach it somewhere here. Not because just by yourself only. That I feel is really um, uh, interconnected, makes you humble, but at the same time appreciate for others and environment or everything. Interconnected is a really important idea for make our life more meaningful and at the same time more wise. So the first kind of happiness, basic happiness, is about just simply learning how to enjoy when things are well and how not to get overtaken by emotions when things are more challenging, when life throws us one of its inevitable curveballs. The second part, interconnected happiness, this is about finding meaning, the satisfaction that comes from living in harmony with our environment, with the people in it, with the whole, with the whole universe, you can say. Because really, we act so much of the time as if we're this separate individual, and yet the reality is we're not. What you do affects me, what I do affects you, what we all do together affects everybody else. And, um, you know, we even now know things like the uh, bacteria in our gut can radically affect our mood. 
right? right. So, so this just shows how, how interconnected we are. Another an experiment we talk about in the book that's called the Cookie Monster Experiment, that um, these students are asked to work on some boring uh, bureaucratic uh, new rules at their university. And so they, they're invited in groups of threes to come into the room to, to, to talk about the rules. And uh, one of them is randomly selected to be a leader. And after 30 minutes of discussion, somebody comes in with a plate of four cookies. And each person takes a cookie. Now, three people, each person's taken a cookie. Who gets the fourth cookie? 76% of the time, it's the randomly chosen leader. Nobody questions like, hey, don't you think we should split that cookie into three? Or, you know, I didn't have lunch today. I'd really like to have the cookie. Why does the leader get the cookie? It's like, it's, we think we're always making our own decisions, but actually so much of what we choose, what we decide, who, what, what even like, you know, our, our politics are, are based on the environment we're in. The, the people we choose to, the people we identify, the traumas we suffered as children, the, um, you know, the, the culture we're raised in. And so, uh, you know, I lived in, in uh, the U.S. for a long time. Now I live in France. And the way French people think about things is very, very different than the way American people think about things. It's not right or wrong. It's that we end up just, this is what we mean by an interconnectedness. We end up being affected by whatever situation we're in. And so, you, you know, 76% of the time, you're going to let the leader have that cookie. Yeah. And so that living in light of interconnectedness means that we be, can begin to unwind our habitual way of reacting and responding to each other and view ourselves and the world around us more and more authentically. And then our decisions will actually really be ours and not simply because of, you know, some... some situation. Yeah, some situation. That's right. Of course, it'll always be partly the situation. Hmm. And then there's mastering dignity. Mm -hmm. I think that... The dignity, I think, is a very, very important uh, in whatever we actually do, because when you uh, create, say, basic happiness, imagine, imagine saying that, are you happy? When somebody asks you, and you are happy, but it's really sincerely from bottom from your heart can be decide and say, yes, I'm really happy today. That not many times happens. No. Yes, I'm happy, but yeah, I'm happy, but then they have other things lined up. Why? That is the question. Because you do not have decisiveness, that means you don't have no dignity yet, complete. Not confident, decisive. That is the dignity. So how do you get that? So learn to be decisive in the beginning. When you will be happy, yes, I'm happy. No but. So you're making happiness a choice. Happiness from feel, when you are happy, make a decide that you make sure that you are happy and you're enjoying that happiness, and don't let go, the, uh, looking for other things negative. Then you don't enjoy the moment of happiness. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I can really feel that when you mm -hmm. when you speak. Mm -hmm. So, so the thing we didn't talk about interconnectedness is how to make it come blossom in our lives. And so there's a, we walk the reader through a series of exercises where you again and again and again experience interconnectedness and then warm-heartedness, which is actually something we all possess. We possess present moment awareness. We possess warm-heartedness, but we cover it up. So here, these exercises uncover our natural warm-hearted quality. And that enables us to find this kind of satisfaction and meaning in life. And is it, again, there's some science, you can read it in the book, as to, as to, that shows that, that this is um, not just something two Buddhists are saying, but that actually is, is also being discovered uh, in modern science. I mean, mm -hmm. Buddhists have been saying it for 2,500 years, but now modern science is catching up. Okay, so 
when Rinpoche talks about decisiveness, there's another kind of decisiveness that's really important, which is as you taste basic happiness, as you taste interconnected happiness experientially in your own life, you begin to believe it. You begin to accept it. You make a choice, a decision that this is, you know, how you want to live your life, how you want to manifest your life. And that is where you begin to find dignity. Dignity, to go back to our lion and, and dog mm -hmm. example, this is, the, this is really the heart of what it means to be a lion. So a lion isn't spending time thinking, I'm so powerful, you're so weak. A lion just simply knows what it can do, not in comparison to anyone else. So pride is something where, you know, it's always, I have this talent and you don't. Dignity is knowing you have the talent, but also even being able to appreciate and enjoy when someone else is, is maybe better than you at it. So how do we do that? By bringing together present moment awareness and warm heartedness, making the decision that this is an important thing to bring forth in our lives, to uncover this gift that we already possess, that's already ours, and, and to live by it. Exactly. And that's the beginning of dignity. And to practice it. Yeah. It sounds like with anything, yeah. to really own it, you've yes. been practicing That's right. the basics yeah. and then the interconnectedness, right. and then you really own it. So how did you get to be a great skier? Right? Yeah, that's how I'm relating. Right? That's right. It mm -hmm. is exactly like, it's just like we, to be, to, um, everyone understands physical exercise is important, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't take care of your body, you're going to have problems. In the same way, we need to exercise our mind. If we don't take care of our mind, we're going to have problems. And so that's, that's why we, in the book, we call them exercises. They're, they're, it's like a kind of mind training, if you will, so that, um, so that we can take care of our mind in much the same way. Mind yoga. yoga. My, yeah, that's right. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Could you, I know this isn't uh, part of the book, but maybe in book two, yeah. um, but it's a big part of, of your belief system, mm -hmm. that of impermanence. And it's something that we all, um, it kind of has a scary connotation to it, but it's something that is very much reality. Uh, nothing stays the same. Hmm. Can you give us any, uh, an explanation of what it means to you? And also, you had such a beautiful example yesterday that really eased my, um, my sense around it. Um, and, and really what I'm, what I'm recognizing with everything that you're saying is all of these practices are helping us cope with the reality of, of, of this life. Um, and I think especially in these times where so many things are uh, in shif shifting, that there can be a lot of fear in our world. Can you help us with, with that, with the idea of impermanence? For me, the, uh, the fear is actually coming because of you don't want to know. Mm -hmm. hmm. Or the attachment. Attachment, of course. But you, when you wanting to see uh, how impermanent is, such as you cannot think five seconds of same thing, the same thought. Thought comes and goes within a split second, and that is the impermanence. So what you're saying is on the most basic level of the fact that our thoughts are always changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can when you know that it's changing, and where, why is the fear for? And that thought is changing, means physical is changing, life is changing, emotion is changing, everything. Everything you see changes is the, the gross level of the thoughts. So when you know that, when you see that, the fear goes much less. When you don't want to see that, the fear is always there. But then, again, you need good practice. Because habits, habitual tendencies, is very wired into it, in our mind. So that's why it's very important to take a little time on that. To completely free from fear is going to take a little time. But you can reduce the fear very much. Yeah, I mean, remember the thing, the story or the example I gave earlier about um, too bad every day can't be like this? That's exactly where the, we start encountering impermanence. Exactly. In this beautiful moment, for me, it was uh, my wife and I going to the beach and just, 
you know, the, we, we just had this extraordinary beach day and I, you know, brought her close to me, looked in her eyes and said, too bad every day, it can't be like this. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, oh my goodness, right? There, I'm fighting impermanence. I'm fighting impermanence. And you're I'm, creating suffering and, by attaching. That's right. In this perfect, exquisite, rare moment that doesn't come in life every day, I'm already creating suffering because I'm not just gently accepting impermanence. The other thing that's interesting being in Silicon Valley is when I look at who the entrepreneurs who were the best, I'm not necessarily saying the most integrated human beings, but in this way they were, which is they knew how to surf the wave of impermanence. They understood that their business had to be constantly renewed, that what you did yesterday to be successful is not what you were gonna to do tomorrow. And if you look at the companies that you know flew high and crashed, it was always because they were somehow attached to things being the way they were, and they couldn't ride this wave of impermanence. Um, you know, and and I, so I think that that was something that was quite eye-opening when I was there and, and seeing like, um, you know, inspiring in a way because to just see how these great these great entrepreneurs could, without a second thought, not just accept it in permanence, but saw impermanence with something to thrive on. Beautiful. I think that's more and more every day these days and getting faster. Yes. And yeah. so if we can really figure that out, then then we'll find success in That's this right. world. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Anything else you guys really want to share? What would you hope that uh, would come from putting this out into the world? I think there's some small changes, you know. I remember when we were making the book in New York City, I mean, he's going through the reading the books and I'm listening all through. Our uh, intention, you know, I'm start only thinking is, uh, to be everybody happy and free from uh, pain and be happy. That is the constantly uh, repeat on the when we do the books. When we're going through this. To be happy, happy and free, and from, free from pain. Free from pain. And uh, that is a whole intention when we actually making the book. It's nothing other than that. So that's what the, the, the what is I really want to hope to see is that. You know, and what is my aspiration is to have everything grow from there and wherever it takes off. How do you receive that on a, on a daily basis? I know that you can meditate on this and, uh, and you can feel it, but how will you know that it has come to be? Or will it never be and that you accept that too? I don't accept it. I think that it can come to be. I mean, We have to try. We can't, we can't start on any endeavor and think, oh, this is doomed to failure. So yeah, it's hard. Everything that's worth doing in a way is a big challenge. But you know, when I think about this book, I actually think about it on a very, very personal level. And, and I, I think Rinpoche too. We started with thinking of so many of our friends and students and people who are feeling like they have to go faster and faster just to only fall a little bit behind. There's something about modern society that is thrilling, but also is creating enormous turbulence and very, very fast change. And, and we really wanted to say, what could we give our friends that would make a difference that they could use today, right away, that almost within a matter of days could transform something or begin to transform something that they could use even you know a year or two later are still going back to and finding it uh, a useful support for this crazy always on wired world that we're all trying to figure out how to how to function in and we see a lot of things are challenging our uh, everybody feels challenged by so many things going on in the world. Some of those challenges are spectacular. Some of them are cause for, for some people to feel quite concerned. But at the basis of it all, this book is trying to help you, fit, by fitting into the life you have, find a way 
to not just cope, but thrive in the midst of all of it. And so that's, I th would say, our hope for what this book could do. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And I think, I believe this book will do, do benefit us. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. That's why we wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is what I believe. So if you could leave us with your compassion meditation, could you share that for anyone who's listening uh, that could take and sit at home tonight or stop the car or stop <laughs> exercising? And could you just share the, the meditation you've shared this week? I think it's a very simple. Uh, when you exhale uh, the breath, then you think, uh, I, I wish everybody happy. Then you inhale that time you you wish everybody free from suffering exhale you everybody happy inhale free from suffering exhale everybody happy inhale everybody free from suffering exhale everybody happiness and inhale everybody free from suffering can you just maintain the little bit This is how you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Exhale. I wish everyone happy. Inhale. I wish everyone free from suffering. That's pretty calming and powerful meditation, eh, friends? I sat for four days listening to the Rinpoche's teachings sitting with this meditation nonstop. And when I left, I definitely left in a peaceful space. And I continue this as much as possible. Rinpoche obviously has a lot to teach. I felt so lucky to spend time in his presence. I hope some of his wisdom resonated with you today as well. If you enjoyed the conversation, give us a review on iTunes and help us spread the word and make sure to subscribe. We've also set up for this new season a Patreon account. Yep, big time. <laughs> you can now become a sustaining patron of the show and help us continue to share these conversations. If you'd like to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash showing up. If you're the first, I will send you a hat of my own art. <laughs> Until next time, see you in the mountains, unicorns.